Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Civitas On Air podcast, where we bring to you informed debate and discussion. This podcast is part of an EU-funded Jean Monnet module, Debut, Debating Europe, Internal and External Dynamics of European Integration at Collegium Civitas. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast. We're going to be talking about the future of Europe, breakdown or breakthrough. And I'm joined today with three of my students who are all bachelor students at Collegium Civitas. We have Filip Gomski. Hello, everyone. From Poland. We have Timabike Bekitova, who's from Kazakhstan. Hi. And also we have Prince Wari, who is from Nigeria. Hello. So we have a very international panel. And I'm going to put to the students a few questions, and they're questions which I think I relate to the future of Europe and how we see that and what we think might be unfolding over the next 5, 10 or 15 years. So first of all, let me ask the students, what do you think in general terms about the European Union? Would you say that it's in decline? And the first question is for Philip, please. So in my opinion, I think that uh, I have a pretty divided answer. Because on one side, we see Europe um, united on issues such as the war of Russia and Ukraine, uh, the energy crisis. We also see the uh, unification in terms of the environment, where in 2015, we had the Paris uh, environmental deal. And many of the goals of that deal were to just have Europe as a first climate neutral continent carbon neutral continent, sorry. But then on the other side, we have the kind of the decline of Europe. Uh, We see that, for example, in the matter of refugees, where basically each European country makes their own policies. They're split on the opinions concerning that topic. For example, we had um, Italy quarreling not that long ago with France about an NGO refugee boat that they didn't accept, even though in a deal signed not only by Italy and France, but with them, they had a deal where both of the countries should accept the refugees. And lastly, and lastly, we also had the, the fascist kind of like uh, right, more right wing governments growing, uh, growing in popularity. We had this in Poland, Hungary and Italy now, where we see that Europe just wants to, each of the countries want to go their own way. They want to separate from Europe. And that would be all for my opinion. Thanks. That was a really full answer. So it seems to me from what you say, it's a very mixed picture. We have lots of reasons to believe that there's the prospect for more integration, more um, prospect for sharing policies and building common institutions. But as you said, there's also rising nationalism and populism in a whole number of countries. And it seems from a current perspective that there's a potential domino effect for other countries to join that trade trend. Um, Let me turn to Timo Biket now. You're from Kazakhstan, which is associated somehow with the European Union, with lots of trade links, um, for example. I'm really interested to know what you think about as to whether the European Union is in decline. Uh, For me, I think that the EU, also, of course, its power varies uh, from issue to issue, from policy area to policy area, and then by geographic location. Overall, its power is declining, uh, owning primarily to internal uh, disagreements and the inability to adapt common external policies in many regards. And why I think it's in decline, first of all, when looking at the EU's crisis management capacity, so we can see that, especially in relations to its next eastern neighborhood, it does not act, but rather reacts to some situation and escalation of crisis. Its uh, capacity to act remains limited, and a lot of European initiatives were constantly failing in the region. Uh, And secondly, the EU, I think, as a so-called guardian of democratic values, is currently failing to live up to its promises. So we can see, as Philip mentioned, deteriorations in key aspects of liberal democracy, such as problems with the rule of law, freedom of press, freedom of expression, issues with discrimination and state racism in many EU countries. And I think that EU can only be as democratic as its member states are. Therefore, uh, deteriorations in this regard undermine the influence and overall image of the EU. And lastly, I think that also EU is quite strong when it comes to uh, economy, its largest aid donor and single market in the world. It's quite weak when it comes to security and defense. 
And also, to sum up, I think that uh, the lack of shared vision uh, constrained the EU from exploiting its full potential and becoming a influential and influential world player uh, in the international arena. I think I tend to agree with you. We certainly see in the past, at the moment and in the future, the EU will remain an important trade player. Like you said, the largest market in the world, foreign direct investment, an aid donor, et cetera, et cetera. But as you also said, in a way, none of that is is valuable if democratically we're, we're weak, if politically and in terms of conflict resolution, the EU isn't really in a position to contribute and to make the neighbourhood, as you mentioned, but elsewhere, a better and stronger, a more resilient place. So thank you very much for the answer. That was really full and I appreciate that that um, contribution. Let me turn to, to Prince. I'm interested in your view on this, whether you think the EU is in decline or whether there's a more positive picture at play. From my own perspective, uh, I think that the EU is more relevant in today's world. I come from Africa in the first place and my own continent says... Uh, Europe as a continent of peace and stability. Most of us travel to Europe to come and work or to come and, and do uh, have our studies, and we feel more secured um, being in the EU or being in any of or being in Europe as as a whole, doing our our businesses and our schoolings and any other kind of. Uh, thing that brings us to this place. So it is seen more as a place of where we uh, we have, we see peace in the continent because uh, the EU itself has been described as a place of um, as, a, as, as a place of peace despite that the war in Ukraine uh, keeps on going on there is this much migration that, that keeps on coming to Europe because my own area keeps on thinking that Europe is, is, a, is a big brother that harbors everybody despite from where you, where you come from, your, na- your nationality or whatever. So I see it more of, of, uh, of, of that aspect that it is more relevant and also in terms of aid, development, and diplomacy, EU has been able to live up to its responsibility in that, in that aspect, despite the internal wranglings in some countries um, uh, where they have some uh, uh, differences in, in their uh, political uh, alignment. So that is all from my own side. Thank you. That was a really, again, fulsome answer. And I really um, find it interesting that you have this outsider perspective. And I think it is worth remembering that despite the internal wranglings, as you call it, Europe and the European integration and the EU does remain this beacon of prosperity and a beacon of peace. And certainly, you know, we often call the European Union a peace project, an ongoing peace project. And of course, we've got a war in our neighbourhood and we're not perhaps dealing with that as best we can. But nevertheless, you know, if you look at the bigger picture, if you look at the way in which peace was restored between France and Germany, for example, after the Second World War, you know, those things are are revolutionary. Um, And the same goes with the Western Balkans too, um, former Yugoslavia integrating into the EU has become a big part of their story in finding peace and good neighbourly relations, but it remains fragile, obviously. Um, Let me move on to a a related question. Um, Being British, this is something which preoccupies me a lot, the subject of of Brexit, um, namely the UK leaving the European Union. Um, And this is an ongoing process we can see on a day-to-day basis how, in my view, damaging leaving the European Union was, and we still have yet to see the outcome. Um, And I think it's an open question as to whether Brexit will prove to be an inspiration for other countries or whether it will be a cautionary tale. In other words, whether it was so bad and disastrous that other countries will not even consider leaving. Um, What does everyone think, you know, is Brexit proving to be a positive example something that other countries might follow. Let's start with Philip, because you're from Poland and we have heard this term polexit in the past. What's going on? What's the state of play? 
Um, well, I think we have to examine like um, the countries. I would also like to bring Hungary into the mix because um, Hungary is also as the quite the separatist government right now. Um, and I think what those countries share in common, so Poland and Hungary, that they do not share with uh, the UK, is obviously the economy that they have. Poland and Hungary are too reliant on European funds to actually do what the uh, United Kingdom did. Uh, that's because hung actually Hungary and Poland, which is quite ironic, is the biggest... They, they get the biggest amount of funds from the UK, uh, from the EU, compared to other countries. I think on third place there was also Greece, but the irony here is that Poland and Hungary, which are two of the biggest uh, fund takers, they want to actually split from the EU, which uh, I don't think it's a good idea for them, since they actually take so much funds. And I do not think it will happen, because you cannot compare the two countries' economy to the one of UK. I think that's completely right, and it's important to point out that big economic discrepancy between the two countries in Central Europe and, and the UK. Let me push you a little bit further. Um, you know, at the same time as, for example, the Polish and the Hungarian government trying to push this idea of, or threatening in a way, to leave the European Union, certainly in Poland, the population remains very pro-European integration, consistently high, and I think one of the highest in, in Europe, actually. So do you think it's a case of the government and the current law and justice government in a way just messing with the population's heads, just trying yeah. to stir up trouble and chaos in a way and uncertainty? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's just like you said, like most of the Polish people, they are pro-European Union. They want to see the European integration. But we do have quite the right wing government. Uh, which is trying to just push their own agenda. And obviously, uh, the European Union does not want to let them do that because some of their policies have been quite, well, they're damaging to the freedom of the Polish people. Like we had, for example, with the justice system uh, in Poland. I'll talk about that later. And um, that's just one example of how the law and justice uh, political party wants to just push their agenda and the, e the EU is basically blocking them from doing so and putting sanctions on them or blocking funds in a way. Yeah, I think you're right and I think we'll turn to it a little bit later but certainly when we look at um, gender policy, family policy, LGBTQI+, plus, etc., um, that these, the government is pushing an agenda which is really diametrically opposed yep. to... European Union norms and preferences and the kind of policies that, that are being um, pushed and accepted, actually, around um, Europe. Um, how about Tamabike? How does Brexit look to you? I think that also there are voices from Hungary to Italy and Poland to leave the EU. There is currently no government with a majority of power to actually do it. Also, from what I know and from what I hear here in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, public opinion remains to be pro-EU and also economic consequences of Brexit for the UK uh, will not strengthen the desire to voluntarily withdraw from the Union either. And I think that in the near future, the economic condition of countries with anti-EU sentiments is unlikely to enhance to the point where they will be better off outside the Union. Therefore, the lack of a proper alternative because now there is no organization that they can join to receive the same benefits. So the lack of this alternative would keep uh, current member states inside. Yeah, absolutely. And at least, I say at least in inverted commas, but the UK does have this, you know, history of global trade and there are parts of the Commonwealth around, around the world that the UK can, in theory, rely upon as trading partners. Reality suggests something different. But Poland and Hungary simply don't have that that kind of background. So there's um, a simple explanation there. And the, the impulse for leaving the EU isn't as strong or realistic, in fact. Yeah, exactly. And let me turn to, to Prince. Again, your perspective on Brexit, how does it look? Um, and what might be the effects of that, if at all, with regards to other member states? Um, for me, joining and leaving the EU is not an easy process. In the first place. The Brexit was becoming a pattern for some member states to leave the EU, but it's a long process, it's cumbersome. So, and again, the political disarray in London has made leaving the EU 
the EU's um, hard sell on the continent. The whole process of the Brexit, um, Brexit has been so complicated, has been so difficult. Uh, this has made people realize that you don't leave the EU so easily. For example, you can you see like uh, uh, the Euro skeptic parties in France, the Netherlands, and Sweden have since backed off calls for similar referendum and focus on changing the EU from within. And um, and with the current crisis going on in Ukraine, I don't think any of the EU member states want to leave as they all need each other at this time to resolve the war and maintain global peace. Thank you. I think the war in Ukraine, Russia's war against Ukraine, has definitely brought minds together. It has proven, I think, a level of solidarity OK, it could be more, but certainly is present amongst most member states. Um, and, and again, as you said, you know, Brexit is such a complicated, ongoing process. And actually, just today, I saw in the British press that Parliament is being asked to rewrite a load of British um, laws to make them, well, what will eventually be less compatible with the EU, which is bonkers, because the EU's will still remem- remain the most important trade partner for the UK even after Brexit. So again, the, the nitty gritty of leaving the EU is is profound and wide ranging. So we've got a mixture of positive and negative stories going on with European integration right now. Another important and ongoing dynamic which has characterise the European Union, Union or the EEC as it was from the very start is enlargement. Ever since 1972-73 the European Union has been going through an ongoing process of getting bigger and bigger through the, the policies of enlargement. So not only has the European Union been deepening over time with more policy competences and institutions but we've also seen the EEC grow from its original small number all the way up to, well, it was 28, now it's 27. So, and there's a whole stack of countries in different parts of Europe and on Europe's fringes who are waiting to join the European Union. So either they're candidates already or they're associated countries. Uh, I'd like to really hear your views on that because it's a really fascinating and and very, very important topic. Um, Tamabiko, what's your understanding of enlargement? Where are we going with that right now? What's the current situation? So all the enlargement, technically, on paper, it's ongoing. Uh, Realistically, we can see that there is certain reluctance within some member EU member states uh, to enlarge, uh, with some member states effectively advocating EU reform in the first place. And now, but in order to stay relevant, I think the EU cannot close the doors and it should uh, continue enlargement. And right now, with the war and everything going on, it's important to integrate current candidates such as the Western Balkans, Ukraine and Moldova into the EU's uh, internal policies. But realistically, Accession talks can take and will probably take years, if not decades, which is seen with the case of Turkey. Also, some people say that Ukraine may be the next member country, but the war should end first. And since Ukraine is a relatively huge country by EU standards, I think that its accession will require profound structural changes in the EU bodies. Also, since seats in the parliament and in the council are located according to population size, Uh, it will give Ukraine a relatively influential voice in decision-making. And I think that current quite influential EU member states would not allow for the shift of power to happen. Therefore, they would most probably postpone Ukraine's accession. And some countries that technically have European territories, such as Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, I think they will either... uh, not be able to qualify for membership or will not be regarded by the EU as European states. Therefore, I think accession process and just enlargement in general will end in the Western Balkans and Ukraine. But at the same time, I think what's important to note and keep in mind is that the constant failure of the EU to keep its promises to uh, current candidate states might reduce its attractiveness to them, which will in the future might be less interested in joining the EU. Also, I think the EU should be more tough on itself and um, so they're not sufficiently tough on their own member states why they're very harsh on candidates that are trying to join therefore the accession process take so much time and it could potentially change uh, their mind in the future therefore they should this all those strategies and policies should be carefully managed 
It's always striking to me how enlargement is characterised by two main elements, and I, I think you just covered them. There's the big picture, the geopolitical issues, having countries in or out makes a difference, and that's tied to identity, which countries are considered to be European or not. And I know that Turkish membership is linked to that very much. But also, of course, enlargement is highly technical in the way in which you described it. There's a, you know, a book of laws, there are norms, there are standards that potential member states have to reach, and they're far-reaching and they're very difficult if they want to even be considered to be a, um, a member in the future. And the bigger the European Union gets, the tougher it is to get in because it's a more comprehensive institution. But let me just push you a little bit further on this. You're from Kazakhstan. Can you yes. imagine the future where Kazakhstan might be a member? Or do the people from Kazakhstan fancy joining the European Union? Actually, the first time I thought about it, it was during our lessons when you said about it that whether do you think Kazakhstan might become a member? So think a little bit further, Azerbaijan, Armenia. And I think that people in Kazakhstan don't think that we'll ever become member members of the EU because um, I think the issue is with identity. So as you said, uh, there is a so-called European identity and Kazakhstan, although they have Uh, European territories, and actually, in fact, Kazakhstan has more European territories than Turkey has. But Turkey is a current candidate, and Kazakhstan is not even like considered. But I think there is still this, uh, you know, issue with identity, a uh, very different mentality, maybe h different history path. Uh, so Kazakhstan has the so-called Eurasian, like something between Asia and Eurasia. So it's very hard. And Kazakhstan's geopolitical situation also is quite complicated. So we share a border with China and Russia, and we need to uh, find this middle ground between two quite powerful regional players. So I think in the near future, I mean, in the next 10 years, I think these talks will not be uh, largely discussed, but maybe in the future, <laughs> who knows. I think for certain Kazakhstan, in terms of trade, in terms of investment, is really, really important to the European Union, but it's quite a long way away. There are lots of countries in between, and as you correctly said, uh, it's China and Russia who share borders with your country, and because of that, there's always going to be a, a closer and more dynamic relationship, and the EU has to take account of that. But I do know that, like yourself, lots of students from Kazakhstan tend to come and study in Europe as Erasmus students or as, let's say, regular students. So I think those societal links are very strong and they will only grow. And I think Kazakhstan is in the... Um, and I know that trade is growing between Kazakhstan and European Union states. And I think it's going to be a, you know, a beginning of a much more sophisticated relationship. But of course, how things go in Ukraine is going to impact upon that relationship. Philip, I know that you've been thinking about these issues as well, about enlargement where we currently are and the implications on the EU as it stands. I'd really like to hear your views. Well, I think um, just as my friend here touched upon really briefly, uh, I would like to expand the fact of um, the fact that the European Union has been lax on some of its members. We see, for example, that uh, on one side it's punishing some members for not doing what they're supposed to, for example, like Poland uh, and Hungary, but they're not punishing all of their members and most, most of all the most powerful members, such as France. Uh, France had a lot of, implemented a lot of anti-Muslim policies, uh, which basically focused around, well, the Muslim community losing a lot of money in their businesses due to the laws that uh, the French uh, government has implemented. Uh, the laws basically focus around uh, increased uh, checking on the business and if you have, for example, uh, a million, let's say a thousand businesses that are targeted for like routine, constant routine checks, then sooner or later there's going to be something bound to like discover that something's not right. And that's the way that the French government has been shutting a lot of the Muslim businesses And we just see that they're not doing the same thing to the French business owners and uh, just uh, business owners from other uh, ethnic groups, not, not Muslims. Uh, in Poland, however, we do see a way, which I think, in my opinion, 
in the European Union how it should act, uh, which is, for example, the Polish government has changed their constitution not long ago, um, making the changing the judicial system and the way that judges are ser- selected in Poland. Basically, in a very brief kind of like um, summary, the judges right now are selected by the leading party because they select the chair of judges, which later select the other judges. So basically, peace and uh, so the law and order party, they have uh, quite the control over the uh, judicial system right now. Obviously, the European Union sees it as a bad thing, which it obviously is. And so it has decided to cut some of the funds that block some of the funds that uh, Poland would otherwise receive. And I think this way of um, controlling already existing members should be applied to everyone. And I think it's a really good idea of doing it by basically it's not it's like blocking the reward of being uh, a European Union country. It, It is obviously very important that when we discuss enlargement and when we plan to include more members, members such as Moldova and Ukraine and the Western Balkans as well, they do fall into the the circles or the sphere of European identity. But on those crucial issues to do with democracy, rule of law, um, readiness to trade with the EU or within the EU single market, they still have quite a long way to go. And whilst we focus on that and hold them to fairly high standards, surely we can't just ignore what existing member states are are actually doing. There seems to be some, you know, heavy double standards going on there. So thank you very much for highlighting that. All in all, this has been a really, really interesting discussion. I've been really happy to be a part of it. The EU is constantly evolving. It revolves around widening and gaining new members, but also deepening it's increasingly facing really big geopolitical, political and economic questions. And the war in Ukraine definitely brings into focus how relevant and how effective the EU is or isn't on the world stage and in its immediate neighbourhood. The EU is always thinking about its future. There's almost, it feels like, endless discussions about the future of Europe, where we want to see ourselves. There's a lot of conceptualization about what the EU is and what it should be in normative terms. I'm really interested now in really hearing from the three of you how you see the future of Europe. If you were to be working within an EU institution or a national government, what's your vision? How is the European Union and European integration going to evolve, do you think, over the next period of time? Let's switch to Prince right now. Um, Tell me your view. What do you see? What's your vision? For me, I think the EU will continue to face its internal challenges within their member states, such as uh, constitutional rights, freedom of expression, democracy, and the list goes on. I see a Europe that, like for instance, take for instance the issue of the war in Ukraine, uh, will be prolonged if the European Union and its allies, such, such as the uh, United States of America, Canada, NATO, and do, doesn't step up again in calling for Russia to cease fire, because I see Russia continuing this aggression on Ukraine, thereby threatening the peaceful coexistence of Europe, which will have um, negative effects on its economy in the long run. So when the economy is, is affected because of the war, Europe may be a little bit shaken in terms of the uh, global economic scale, among the committee of nations and um, i see i see the eu also uh, trying to fight new the, the new virus of uh, covid-19 this we call for a global health emergency from the eu member states its allies to step up uh, the fight against covid-19 for public safety once public safety is is guaranteed i think europe will be more accommodating we will, will be more um, interesting to live in work and um, do all sort of things in according to law according to the laws of of the, the, the european union so this is my own point of view about europe concerning what i've um, shared already so it sounds like we're all going to be really busy 
over the next decade with public health, dealing with social policy, dealing with our societies, freedom of expression. I completely agree with that, freedom of association. In many countries, and including my own, the UK, all of those rights or it seems going to be gradually eroded away and I think we have to be aware of that. And probably, well, hopefully you're not correct that the Ukraine war is going to continue to to go on and um, as, as the background to, to European integration. Let me ask a kind of side question to you there, Prince, considering um, your, your, your background, but also, you know, being here in Europe. Despite all these difficulties that we've spoken about, and you have already mentioned that Europe still remains this relative island of peace in the world. Is Europe an inspiration to other regions around the world to form regional integration? I'm thinking about the African Union, for example. Despite its problems in Europe, are we inspiring other countries around the world to integrate and find a common voice? I, I think... Um the European Union is actually, for me, uh, it has been an inspiration to most African countries. But one challenge with the African countries or African Union in quotes is that we are still we are, we are still developing in our individual nations. We have our different cultural backgrounds, our, our different laws, constitutions, and forms of government. So coming to form together a, a complete African Union has been kind of difficult because even in the African Union, we still have divided regional associations or bodies like the West African Union and the North and the Northeast and just different, just the different unions. And it's been difficult to work together to achieve a common aim like how the uh, European Union uh, is well coordinated in doing their things like take for instance when when the covid came eu was well coordinated in in the in the vaccine production uh sharing it to their member states and even giving to outside countries you know but in the african union there was this dispute of funding distribution geogra geographical location so many factors that that played in and even political uh, differences within the uh, the union because some countries are still fighting some wars internal wars and that cooperation was the kind of bit difficult so in the long run eu has been an inspiration you know on paper for us but the african union still finds it difficult to get to that standard because of the limits or the boundaries they have set for themselves. So that is um, my take on that. Thank you. It, it's a, a really important, interesting question. And I think what Europe shows is that these things don't happen overnight and that common positions, a shared identity, common institutions take a couple of decades to actually come about. And, of course, what inspired or what was the... Um, the kickstart, if you like, for Europe integration in the 1950s was the background of the war, of the Second World War. And it seems that it took that trauma, that devastation, to actually put the, the engines under the will of, first of all, France and West Germany to start integrating. And we know that story after. Integration is an ongoing process. Um, but I think it's an important area for us to watch if and how things happen in Africa in a similar way to European integration, because it can happen, but it takes leadership and vision. And But eventually these things can come about. So thanks for that additional question. I know that I put you on the spot, but um, that answer was really very useful and interesting. Philip, again, your perspective on this. How do you see Europe evolving or devolving uh, breakdown or breakthrough over the next period of time? Well, I think most of it will be dictated by the result of the war. I think if we analyze it, it just basically comes down to the NATO supplying Ukraine with funds and arms versus Russia being able to withstand the sanctions and the costs of the war and just seeing which of the two is going to outlast the other. Because obviously, like... Um, 
trying for the NATO countries to actually fund and give tanks, uh, I don't know, helmets uh, and funds to Ukraine that's actually taking, well, it's quite a bit of money. And I don't know if I see it lasting in the wrong, long run to have such a backing as it did at the beginning, uh, where basically every country basically scrambled to give something to Ukraine. So I think that's going to be quite the challenge for Europe. I do think, however, that in five, ten years, maybe, Russia will sign some kind of uh, deal with Ukraine, trying to basically... They will probably keep the Ukrainian territories they already conquered, but at least Ukraine will remain as a sovereign country. Then I think we also need to analyze the refugee problems, because currently the amount of refugees in the world is huge and increasing still and i think uh, european union needs to take action in that regard as well i think that there is a chance that um, some of the countries will actually uh, start accepting more while others will start accepting less uh, and that also leads me to another idea that i had which is that europe the european union could split up into certain coalitions so we for example see Poland, Hungary and Italy having a quite the similar government type and basically they could basically split into this, as I said, like little co coalition without within the European Union, uh, making them have a, obviously more power. Lastly, I think we also need to mention about the energy crisis and how that's going to be resolved. Uh, we obviously know that the energy reserves that we have, such as oil, gas it's obviously decreasing and it's going to be a challenge in the long run right now also with russia blocking the energy sources they're not selling them to the european countries uh, and i think that's also like raising quite the big uh, divide when it comes to the european union because it will all come down to whether they will actually stand together and face the problem together or will it cause them to uh, act in the benefit of their own state leading to a breakdown of the European Union. So it seems that I think we all agree, and maybe it's kind of obvious in a way, that the future of Ukraine is going to be define, defining for yeah. the future of, of Europe and how, we, how, Euro how Ukraine fits in with this mosaic, if you like, of European integration. Let me turn finally to Timo Bike. Uh, same area, what about the future of Europe? What, what's your vision? How do you see things developing? Uh, I think it's really hard to make any predictions, especially t uh, considering everything going on, what's going on right now, like so many things uh, changing so quickly. But I think that current political situation suggests that more countries will give priority to their own national problems, meaning that the EU would most probably not become a federal political unit. Also, I think that it will be harder to find common ground, come to a consensus when it comes to uh, security, defense, migration, whereas I think environmental issues and climate change will be a certain unifying point for the EU. Also, although there may not be instances of disintegration like Brexit, uh, dissatisfaction that it is on the rise may lead to other forms of disintegration by uh, for instance, countries not complying with the EU rules and EU rules. But at the same time, such a gradual process of dissolution will provide the EU with time to address causes of dissatisfaction. And I think that the EU will be able to do it because there are and there will be still member states in which uh, attachment to the EU is still quite strong. And in this way, they will keep, um, they will allow the EU to keep going. And also, I think that so to answer the question whether the upcoming decade is going to be a breakdown or breakthrough for the EU, I think that the answer is something rather in between. I'm inclined to agree with you. I think according to our discussion, we have a very mixed picture. Ukraine as, as the background is going to be defining um, feature, let's say, for, for Europe's future. That's, that's really beyond doubt. It seems like we have our act together in some areas, but we certainly don't in other areas. The fact that still many countries aspire to become EU member states, I think, is a positive story. And we should take that on board as, as, as such. But as you also virtually all said, 
national interests and sovereign thinking is always bubbling up to the surface. But I think if I can put this in a historical perspective, for example, if I look back over European integration over the past 20 years or so, uh, despite crises, despite wars, despite antagonism and some areas of failure, it does seem that Europe has broke through some difficulties and has advanced in the face of um, crisis and adversity. So it could be that despite things being seemingly or very difficult right now, that this might end up being an impulse for a more integrated, a more prosperous and a more, well, an enlarged Europe in, in the future, but that has yet to be had. What I've enjoyed from this podcast today is that we've we've started to fill in the gaps in our discussions about the future of Europe. I mentioned already that the EU is, is always going over and, and thinking about uh, its future. And that is often just the big picture about institutions and geopolitics. But I do think we need to think about the details in this scenario building as well. Well, this, build, this brings our podcast to an end right now. And I'd like to thank the participants. I'd like to thank Prince. I'd like to thank Temabike. And I'd like to thank Philip um, for their, their participation and their valuable contributions to this discussion. So thank you very much. And we hope that you enjoy it too. And this has inspired you to think about whether the EU is breaking down or breaking through. Thank you so much for listening to Civitas On Air. We cover current and important political and social topics. Our work is produced by researchers and students from Collegium Civitas, together with Radio Palace. Please subscribe to our podcast by visiting your favourite streaming service, like Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And do stay tuned for the next episode.